Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of Encore Live. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to travel to Paris with us. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention a few notes on the setup of the event. I'm sure everyone is very familiar with Zoom by now, especially those of you who have attended previous events. However, I did just wanna mention that the webinar format works slightly differently than a regular Zoom meeting. All attendees are muted and you can see us, but unfortunately we cannot see you. Um, however, we do want this to be an interactive experience. So please use the Q&A function to ask any questions that you might have, and we'll do our very best to answer all of them by the end of the webinar. Uh, additionally, I did wanna mention that this is going to be recorded and will be available to watch on our blog as soon as tomorrow. So please feel free to watch again or share with anyone that may be interested. Fantastic, all right, well, let's get started. My name is Sabrina Nikoloff, and I am a regional director here at Encore Tours. We're going to spend the next half hour or so taking a wonderful tour around the beautiful city of lights, Paris, France. It has long been a very popular and successful tour destination for Encore groups, as we have wonderful relationships with some fantastic venues in the heart of the city, such as La Madeleine, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, and even Saint-Sulpice. Paris is also very close to my heart as I was fortunate enough to live there for a year as a student and to soak up the incredible culture, history and joie de vivre in this incredible city. Today, we have a very distinguished guest to guide us through the aspects of French art, architecture, cuisine, culture, and the link between political power and artistic creation. I'm very pleased to welcome Cecilia Galera, one of our fantastic tour managers who is an expert in France and Spain, and who has a great passion for art, architecture, and of course, traveling. Welcome Cecilia, it's time to bring us to Paris. Hi Sabrina, hi everybody, thanks. Thanks. Just before starting the presentation, I just wanted to add a little something. Uh, I will talk a lot about architecture because I think it's like, a good way to put you in the mood and to let you imagine, but also because I've been working a lot of time as a photographer, like in the world of architecture. So it's like really important for me and, and I hope I will share with you my passion for architecture and for rights. So I'm gonna share my screen so everybody can see the slides and we can start. Oh, to wander in Paris, adorable and delicious existence. Strolling is a science. It is the gastronomy of the eye, Honoré Balzac. There is no, nothing more French than Flané. Flané is not exactly strolling. Flané is walking knowing that you're going to get lost and enjoying the beauty of this detour. So while waiting to be together and getting lost in the street of Paris, I'm going to share with you a virtual plan. One of my favorite things to do when, when I'm on tour is going to the top of the Eiffel Tower. I have been there many times and I don't care about the views that much anymore. The reason why I love to go to the top is to see the faces of the people I'm traveling with, see their surprise or their happiness discovering a city I love. But do you know that the Parisians didn't like the Eiffel Tower in the beginning? The plan was even to demolish it in 1909 because it was meant to be a temporary building. Mr. Eiffel's design won a contest to showcase civil engineering and the advanced use of steel in the, 1918, in the 1899 sorry, World's Fair. But even before the beginning of the construction, many artists protested against the tower. Among them, Charles Gounod, a famous composer, but also the writer Guy de Maupassant, and even the architect of the Paris Opera House, Charles Garnier. In an article that they published against the Eiffel Tower, this is what they say. Will the city of Paris continue to associate itself with the Baroque and mercantile fancies of a builder of machines, thereby making itself irreparably ugly 
and bringing disorder to itself because the Eiffel Tower that even the commercial Americans didn't want will without doubt dishonor Paris. But in the end, as French people bark a lot, but no bite, we slowly fell in love with it. And we decided to keep it with the excuse we were using it, using it as a radio tower. It was really useful to intercept German messages during the First World War. And during the Second World War, the elevator was sabotaged to prevent one lazy Hitler to reach the top using the stairs. But speaking of good views, to my mind, the best place to discover Paris from above is not the Eiffel Tower, but the Arc de Triomphe. I know you will tell me there are, are triumphal arches in a lot of cities and that it can't be such a distinctive monument. Do you know that just in Paris there is four of them? But this is without think, thinking of the great snobism of Napoleon. Not content to request an arch to celebrate the many victories of his great army copying the Roman style in symbolic, he requested to be the biggest and tallest ever. Well, at least during almost 150 years, until an even more egocentric North Korean dictator asked for taller one. From the top of its 164 feet, your ensemble will take the coolest selfie of the skyline with the Eiffel Tower included. And they will see and understand one of the specificities of the city that make it so unique, its urbanism. From the center of the Place de l'Etoile, we are at the middle of the best history book. In front of us, the Axe Historique connects Paris from east to west and starts from the Louvre to finish at La Défense. In a blink of an eye, we see the museum, which was a royal residence since the ages, the Place de la Concorde, forever linked to the guillotine and the revolution, the Champs Elysees. Uh, sorry, first we see the Palace of Elysee, the center of democratic power, the Champs Elysees, symbol of French luxury and chic, and in the other side, La Défense, the financial district symbol of economic de development and the endless growth of the city, far from the classical architecture of the city center of Paris. But Paris is not Paris just because of its major monument. No, it's je ne sais quoi comes from somewhere else, or better said, someone else. I mentioned Baron Osman. The wide avenues with trees, that's him. The facades of limestone with symmetrical and harmonious balconies, that's him. The, the public benches, that's him. The sewers, you get it, him again. Under the impulse of Napoleon III, Baron Osman, prefect of the Seine, remodeled Paris in the middle of the 19th century. Bye-bye medieval Paris, seniors and unhealthy, and hello hygienic and safe ideals of Osman. The guy wants air, people, and money to circulate. In less than 20 years, the city completely changed its appearance, and only the Marais and the Faubourg Saint-Germain still testified of the old-fashioned Paris. One of the particularities of Paris is that, unlike other cities that are constantly rebuilding and evolving, this architecture has been preserved until today. The, the Parisians loved it so much that it's complicated even to propose boastful architecture projects. The dangers of this way of living in the city is to turn it into a museum or a space that is not really suitable for our way of living nowadays. But this is a tricky debate that we can discuss later on if you're interested. Culture is close to a way of being, to a love at first sight to an always unfinished celebration of happiness. This, is this definition of culture by Jean Dormesson, which I find very accurate, could just as well be a definition of Paris, because the city would be nothing without its culture. In Paris, no matter if you are a tourist or a resident, you will always find something to do, see, or listen to. This rich cultural life 
is partly based on an historical support between the power and the artists. I will tell you more about this French specificity and the link between art, state and spectators through three emblematic art artistic institutions, which are Le Louvre, the Opéra Garnier and the Comédie Française. But before looking more closely, it is important to understand how the system of public support is created and the importance of its institution. In the 17th century, thanks to Louis XIV, lover of arts and pomp, the royal academies were created as part of a movement to supervise cultural and artistic life. The king wanted to bring together the most remarkable scholars, scientists and creators. The link between knowledge and power appeared from the first foundation and the dialogue between academics and royal power was maintained until the revolution. The revolution allowed the first great democratization of art, which was then reserved for rich and powerful. The Royal Academies of Arts then became the National Academies and still today they allow for teaching, research and free training of cultural elites. Okay, now that we understand this, let's go to the loop. Built on a medieval fortification, 6th century, a royal palace, and it was during the Renaissance that it slowly took on its new artistic function. Louis XIV, who found it too small and not flashy enough for him, decided to move to Versailles. And until Louis XVI, the Louvre was gradually abandoned and at the same time enlarged and rebuilt. The Academy of Arts and Sculpture then take advantage of this situation to squat in the palace to produce and exhibit in the same place the fruit of their work before the king recovers it. At that time, the artists had salon in the Louvre once a year, a kind of big open bar where the works were piled up in, on the wall and the people stuffed into the room. Thanks to the revolution, more than 100, 100 years later, art is not only intended for rich and powerful anymore. Indeed, according to the precept of the revolution, the Louvre became officially a museum in 1793. And from then on, its collection doesn't stop to grow. At first, in a spirit of redistribution to the people, it contains the masterpieces coming from the royal and the clergy collections. But very quickly, the collection grows under the impulse of Napoleon's conquest. That way, several countries were plundered to fill the museum. I think it's important as a spectator to know the history of the Louvre to understand differently the beauties that it gives us to see. Nowadays, looking to the future and trying to make a duty to remember its system of acquisition sometimes dubious, the Louvre is now exported. The recent opening of Abu Dhabi's Louvre allows a reread of art and representation that is no longer, no longer made only from the point of view of the colonizer or the historically predominant power. I would now like, like to talk to you about another typical French institution and look at the site of the theater. I want to talk about La Comédie Française or Le Français for the more snobbish among us. To understand where the oldest theater institution comes from, we must once again turn to the side of Louis XIV because it changed forever the destiny of Jean-Baptiste Poquelin and the history of French theater. Before becoming Molière, Jean-Baptiste Poquelin was a young bourgeois, passionate about words and theater. But in the 17th century, it's not easy to be an actor or to live from his heart. The only way to survive was then patronage. A kind of sugar daddy who provides for both authors and troops to allow them to create without dying of hunger. And Molière gets it well, because from a fortunate patron to another fortunate patron, he managed to arrive to the core of Louis XIV. Quickly, Louis XIV puts a theater and money at Molière's disposal, and he then writes his best plays. Obviously, the king loved art, 
but big parties and endless extravagant plays were also a way to keep the courts busy and under control. Aware of the, pro the power of comedy, Molière used it to criticize the failings of his times and made satire as novel as tragedy. For example, he was a pioneer in denouncing the enslavement of women in society in his play, L'Ecole des Femmes. It is also important to underline that the favors of the king did not oblige Molière to write propaganda, nor did it restrain him in his creation. He remained free and critical throughout his career, even if it meant to see his text forbidden by the censorship as Tartuffe, which criticizes royal religious power. Until today, Molière has remained the soul of la Comédie Française. Like a holy relic, one can admire in the Sire de Richelieu, official theater of la Comédie since the end of the 18th century, the armchair where he was sitting the night he died playing Le Malade d'Imaginaire. Seven years after Molière's death, Louis XIV founded the Comédie Française, gathering the two most popular troops of the time, one of them, Molière's one. By this act, Louis XIV consecrated excellence, but also imposed a financial control, which with time has become a subsidy received by the institution from the state. The Comédie Française takes as a symbol a beehive and as a motto, simul et singulis, to be together and to be oneself. Right now, it consists of uh, 57 actors who perform both classical and contemporary plays. The theater works as a cooperative of actors and they are involved in the functioning of the theater from the performances to the management. Before becoming an official member of the troupe, the newcomers are first residents. This is a precarious status that is really discussed everywhere, every year by the, by the troupe that can dismiss you, that can dismiss you. Once you are an official member of the troupe, you have a five-year contract that is endlessly renewable. The troupe has to be the priority of the actors who can ask for permission to do other projects. The other specificity about Le Francais is the concept of alternation, alternation of plays and actors. In a single week, up to five different plays may be presented at the Salle Richelieu and several actors are distributed on the same row. The other, sorry, the, the Garnier Opera House is the last institution I want to talk about. It is a mythical building that arbors more than one peculiarity. Also conceived and created under the canon of the Second Empire and for the Emperor Napoleon III, history caught up with the project and the Opera House was inaugurated and invested under a completely different regime, the Third Republic, 15 years after the beginning of the construction. And all started because of a bomb. In 1858, Napoleon III was targeted by a, bo a bomb while going to the back then only Opera House in Paris, Rue Pelletier. The attack killed a dozen of people, but the emperor was miraculously safe and ordered a competition to build a new theater to his glory in a street less likely to be ambushed. It is a young architect of 35 years, Charles Garnier, who wins the competition despite his lack of experience in large scale projects. He will face big challenges all along the construction. One of the biggest problems is discovering that the land was too sandy to build on it. But Garnier found a way to save the project using wisely the disadvantages of the basement. He had a tank built that extended under the central part of the building. And once filled with water, the tank creates pressure to keep flexibly, flex, flexibility and at the same time ensure the stability of the foundation. Garnier was far from imagining that this tank will also become a reservoir of fantasy. Gaston Leroux will make it the lair of his ghost for his novel, The Phantom of the Opera. By imagining a real lake under the opera house, he creates a metaphor for the unconscious, for the unconscious 
of the bourgeoisie at that time, using the opera house as a bottom, as a double bottom place. On the surface, the coded and civilized universe, and underneath everything that we repress from our most secret impulses. Already six years after the beginning of the work, history caught up with, with Garnier's project. Napoleon was impatient to see his theater finished and decided to inaugurate the facade of the Opera House, still under construction, during the 1867 World's Fair, where he wanted to present to the world his new Paris, embellished and lavish. But as a metaphor for the end of his decadent reign, the Opera House was just a beautiful facade that the emperor will never be able to enjoy. In 1870, Napoleon lost the war against Bismarck and Paris was under control of Prussia. The unfinished building site has to stop. With the abdication of Napoleon come the end of the empire and the civil war, which it's Paris, Paris is art. Supporter of a social republic, the Communa, clashes violently with the Versailles, supporters of a conservative republic. During the Commune, the unfinished opera was used in turn as a hospital, a stable, and a food storage facility, and Garnier wrote off the project of his life. But this is without counting with the wink of fate. The Opera House on Rue Pelletier caught fire in 1873. The recent Third Republic found itself without an opera and decided to call upon Garnier to achieve his work. The Emperor's Opera then became that of the Republic and the symbol of the rebirth of the nation. The President Mac Mahon inaugurated it in 1875 and the opera, beyond the political divisions of history, can finally accomplish its mission, to spread French excellence and to keep alive the French Grand Opera tradition founded by Giacomo Meyerbeer. Do you know why the French Grand Opera, why in the French Grand Opera, the ballet is rarely before the third act? Because it was fashionable for the wealthy to arrive late at the theater. And so the staging had to be adapted to the mores of the time so that all the spectators could see the ballet. But beyond the form, the Grand Opera is characterized by a great deployment of myths. Between, between the corps de ballet, the orchestra, and the technicians, more than 200 people can be necessary for a single work. The Garnier Opera was also design, designed for the intermission which allowed the technicians to, to switch and slide the immense sets while the spectators enjoy the social life in the areas des designed uh, for this purpose. The Avant Foyer, a space never built before in an opera house, allows the rich bourgeois to parade or make business. The gas painting are a fantastic way to imm immerse ourselves in the atmosphere of the Paris of the time. Nowadays, the corps de ballet is the most famous part of the opera. It is composed of 154 dancers and 18 étoiles, the best of them, nine women and nine men. In its more contemporary history, the election between 2014 and 2016 of a director like Benjamin Milpied, aka Nathalie Sportsman's husband, is a clear attempt to move the institution forward, forward with the time, to avoid the danger of a dusty or museum-like space. The documentary Relève, released in 2015, shows the process of creating a sh the show clear, loud, bright, forward. In 2019, the choreographer Bin Tudembele brings Crump to the opera in a very contemporary interpretation of Les Indes Galantes, a seminal work by Jean-Philippe Rameau from the Age of Enlightenment. The work deals with a subject that has not aged a bit, the ambitious, the ambiguous look that the European poses on the other, on the stranger. These are some images of the 
transmission is in guarantee. Gluttony, when we shared as the greatest influence on happiness. What I love about Paris is also its gastronomy. After the play, no matter if it's theater or opera, you don't go home right away. No, you go to the cafe to have dinner, have fun and be seen. On night show, the classical menu is oyster and champagne, but there is just as much charm and history in the more everyday meals. Gastronomy is not just about food. It's all the ritual around it, gathering with people, sharing and enjoying. And in French gastronomy, there is one food which has a special place, le fromage. There is no French meal without a plate of cheese. And cheese with bread is the only of the four courses that many people consider to be a real meal. In regard, each of the other courses, starter, main course, and dessert, can be composed of the wide variety of dishes. Do you know that the French meal with cheese included has been registered in 2010 as, a, as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity by UNESCO? So when you will be in Paris having your first meal with your group, don't forget to tell them that they are eating part of French heritage. But there is few traditions in French gastronomy that may seem a little bit more disgusting. The most famous among them is the snails. I love to take my groups to Montmartre to eat snails on the Place du Tertre. And don't worry, even if they say they will never try them, in the end, they love it. Snails have been eaten since pre 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 prehistoric times, sorry. And we easily imagine that back then, uh, for need of survival, we swallow anything we can find and meet. But the, de the legend tells that Talleyrand, the French diplomat of the 19th century, had, prom had promised to have lunch with the Tsar Alexander of Russia. The two men had agreed to meet in the restaurant in Burgundy, but they were so late that the chef had no food left. He then decided to go to his garden, the chef, and to collect some gastropods. And then he created this fantastic plate mixing butter, garlic, and parsley. Finally, as a real French meal is nothing without dessert, we will fin finish on a sweet note. And what represents better French pastry than macaroon? One of the funniest activities I've done on tour was learning how to bake macaroon in a real Parisian bakery. Historically, macaroon are the desserts of the kings and it was Catherine de Medicis, the mother of Henri II, we imported them from Italy to France and made them so popular. In the beginning, the macaroons were only simple almond cookies, cakes, and they have a lot of variants in, in a lot of regions of France. But at the end of the 19th century, a genius pastry chef had the idea to fill them with ganache and jam. And since, that, since then, they became the official macaron from Paris and the, the recipe is unchanged. And they are now eaten in all the world. So now that we are all salivating, I hope to meet you and your ensemble soon to enjoy Paris together. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cecilia. That was a wonderful presentation about Paris and it definitely mm -hmm gave me the, uh, the travel bug <laughs> to go to go back. I haven't been in, in a while and it was just so nice to see the photos and to learn some of the history and the backstory about the architecture, the food, the, the academies. It was great. So thank you so much. That was super interesting. Um, and I would love now to open the floor to questions. We would love to hear um, any questions from our attendees uh, about the presentation or about France in general, uh, or about even venues that are possible in France, we would love to 
um, between Cecilia and I, we, I'm sure we can answer um, all of your questions. So we would love if you could use the, the question and answer or the chat function, either one will be great, we'll be monitoring. Um, we would love to, to hear your questions. And let's see here, I've got one question. Um, let's see here, for Cecilia. Um, let's see, do you, are there any favorite venues of yours to attend concerts in Paris? Oh, great question. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the Opera Gagne is like the most emblematic place and it's just so magical to go there and to see how you have, you enter and you have the corridors and everything was designed to give you a full experience, not just like to empower the show, but the entire experience. And so, yeah, for me, it's like, it's like, the most like beautiful place to go to see a venue. Yeah, I, I, I've only been on a tour to see the, the building, mm -hmm. but I've never actually seen a performance there. So it's a dream. <laughs> Definitely yeah. would love to do that sometime. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful venue. Um, let's see, we've got another question here uh, for Cecilia. Aside from Paris, uh, what is one of your favorite towns or cities to visit in France? Mm, I really like the south of France. I, I'm from there, so I'm cheating a little bit, but I think that all the region of Provence, it's, it's wonderful. Provence and Côte d'Azur, it's amazing because we have a lot of Roman ruins and it's like so nice to immerse ourselves and imagine what life could be back then. We have arenas, we have aqueducts. And so for this part, it's really nice. But also in, in summertime, the cultural life moved from Paris to the south of France. So there is, for example, in Avignon, there is the, uh, the Festival Theater, which is massive. And Avignon is kind of a small city. And during the entire summer, all the city changes and every bar, restaurant, everything turned into a, a, a theater. And a, com a lot of small troops from Paris and everywhere else come to Avignon to have venues the entire summer. And so this is really nice. Also in Arles, there is a big and beautiful um, photography festival. And, and we have the sea nearby and the land, the, the, yeah, the landscape is really beautiful too. So. South of France, Avignon, Nice is, is really beautiful too and really rich here historically. Fantastic, thank you. That's, um, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> it's a beautiful area. So we've got a couple of questions uh, here as well um, from Diane and Tom Lynn. Hello and thank you for being here. Uh, the, it's a great question. Uh, what would you suggest as an ideal itinerary for a performance tour of France? Um, and Cecilia, if you'd like to kind of, from your point of view, and then I can add some, um, you know, maybe possible venues and things like that, but I uh, would love to hear your thoughts and then I can add anything as well. I, I think I was, I was about to say that I, I think that you, 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 you know more than, than okay. me about this. <laughs> I'm not... Sure, yeah, yeah I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, that's a great, great question. And um, I would say that there are probably two itineraries that I have in mind that work really well for um, either choirs or orchestras or, you know, instrumental ensembles. Um, so the first is uh, to start in Paris and then to end in Paris, but make a bit of a, a loop and uh, to go up to Normandy um, to visit the American Cemetery, which is a very special and um, somber place, but very important in, in American history as well. Um, to go to Bayeux, Bayeux Cathedral is a lovely venue, beautiful, and um, uh, Bayeux itself, you can visit the famous Bayeux Tapestry. Um, so just kind of, you can also visit uh, Le Mont Saint-Michel. Um, the whole area of Norm Normandy is beautiful there's lots to see and um, performance venues are you can actually sing or perform at the American Cemetery as well I should mention that which is very meaningful performance 
um, and then work your way down to the Loire Valley, where which is the home to all the beautiful chateau, and um, you can actually perform in uh, several of the chateaux, um, especially the chateau de Chenonceau, which is the famous chateau that goes over the River Cher. Uh, it's a very special place. Um, and then Tours is kind of the main city in the Loire Valley, which also has beautiful venues such as the St. Gatien Cathedral. Um, so you know, spend a few nights there to visit some of the chateaux, perform, and then uh, head back to Paris for the, for, for example, the last evening of the trip. Um, I, I would suggest spending a few nights, I should have mentioned, in the beginning of the tour in Paris to kind of you know, do a performance there, see the sights, um, and then make your way to the rest of the itinerary, and then come back to Paris and have a last hurrah, last evening in Paris, and, and then fly out the next day. It's a, it's a really nice itinerary, and you get to see three very different regions of France. And, and then another itinerary that I, I love and that works really well for both choirs and uh, instrumental groups is starting in Paris, spending a few days in Paris, and then taking the TGV, which is the, the fast train down to, as uh, Cecilia was talking about, the south of France. It's just such a special and beautiful area. And um, there's lots of really lovely venues that we work with, both in Provence and on the Côte d'Azur in Nice. And uh, so there's, um, there's actually a chateau in Nice called the Chateau Valois that we have organized concerts in. It's a very beautiful place right in Nice. Um, there's also the cathedral in Nice. Um, so there's a lot of great options for concerts. Um, in, and then some of the smaller towns in Provence has some beautiful churches and just kind of a different feel than the bigger cities. So it's a really nice combination and some you know wonderful venues as well. So I know that was a long uh, answer, <laughs> Diane, but I hope that answers your, your question. <laughs> Uh, and we have a question from Leonard Helfrich. Thank you so much for being here. I remember once 30 years ago vi visiting Perpignan. Oh, yes. Um, what about the southwest of France? What is there to visit? Uh, Cecilia, would you mind uh, answering that question? I, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm more used to do the, 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 the Provence side on tour. Sure. So, uh, I actually, I it's it's a region of France that I I done I I I don't know a lot about. Oh yeah, really sure. Sorry, but okay, yeah, I will be on tour one day and and I will discover it myself. But Toulouse is really a beautiful city. Bordeaux, all the wine, the vineyards, this come from that part more than the region, the exactly. region. So there's a lot to discover. There. For sure, yeah. yeah. And Perpignan is so near to Spain. I mean, if you're in Perpignan and you have to go to Spain, it is so nearby. And there is a lot to see and to do in, in Barcelona. And yeah, I'm sure there is a lot of interesting places there also to do venues. Absolutely. I know more about Spain and my side of the south than the other side Great. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and thanks. We have a question um, from Judith Michalski. Thank you, Judith. Uh, the question is, I noticed that there is the El Champ, and then there is a Champ uh, de l'Essai. Uh, so there are, did, did you mean Champs Elysees, uh, perhaps? Um, so there are two main places to stroll through. Is there a difference between one except that one is larger? Um, so between the Champs Elysees, I think, and uh, El Champ. Um, the Champs Elysees is actually, you have, it's like a, a, a small part of the axis historic, which is like super long because it's crossing the entire, the entire city. And the Champs Elysees, is you have a major like road for cars and then you can stroll in the two sides of the of the road you have big sidewalks and in this in this bite who goes to the to the Arc de Triomphe until I don't know until where until the Palace de l'Elysée more or less this this section 
and you have all the shops like you have super luxury brands but also really affordable shop and and souvenir shop and also you can buy gear to do food soccer and and stuff like that it's really like i i really like the how, how you sense it and you have a beautiful view of the Arc de Triomphe and now uh, they are closing this section the Champs-Élysées are closed to the cars on Sunday so it's really really nice to have the entire streets to to walk and just full of people without car this is really really nice hopefully one day it will be like that all the time <laughs> oh yeah that would be nice fantastic yeah, that's a really amazing boulevard to walk down. It's just, there's so much yeah. life, so much going on. It's yeah. really exciting. <laughs> Great. Uh, I don't see any more questions, but feel free to add one if you have thought of one. Um, but I, I wanted to, before we say au revoir, <laughs> I wanted to just mention a few uh, special offerings that we've got um, and events that we have going um, at Encore. Um, I wanted to mention, since we're talking about France today, uh, we have a really exciting new festival that's going to be taking place in uh, June of 2022. The exact dates are June 23rd to the 26th. And it, the title of it is the Festival des Trois Chateaux, or the Festival of Three Castles. It takes place in the Loire Valley, and there will be performances in three of the beautiful chateaux in the Loire Valley, um, and working with a renowned uh, conductor who will be kind of conducting the final uh, concert. Um, it's going to have groups from all over Europe and the US. So it's a really exciting festival that we're really happy to, to be a part of. So if you are interested, um, we have some information on our website and of course, um, feel free to, to contact us um, to learn more. We also wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of our music appreciation tours that we are um, planning for next year in 2022. These tours are a little bit different than what we usually do. It's um, based for it's based on individuals. So uh, anyone can sign up for the music appreciation tours. They are there are two itineraries: one in Central Europe, kind of, um, uh, Northern Germany and Czech Republic, and then we have a Vienna and Salzburg itinerary. And the the focus is music, seeing wonderful performances, kind of getting a back behind the the, the red curtain look at different museums and um, kind of special access to many wonderful um, events and, and people that we have fantastic connections with. So the, the itineraries are really special. Um, we're going to have June and September dates in 2022. And those dates will be coming out very shortly. But I just wanted to mention that we have this uh, fantastic offering now as well. We, I also wanted to mention that we have a worry-free guarantee right now for 2022 groups through October 1st, where all payments would be fully refundable through October 1st. And uh, we have sc new scholarship opportunities where anyone registered for a 2022 tour will be entered into a raffle for a thousand dollar scholarship. And we'll be pulling the winner of the raffle um, on April 1st, all the way through July 1st. So, um, you know, the earlier you register, you'll be put into every single raffle. So it's a really great incentive for, for participants for next year's trip. Uh, let's see if we have any more questions. Oh, looks like we do have some more questions. Let's see. Um, okay. Oh, Diane, great. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so Diane's asking to follow up on the tour itinerary question. And the second itinerary in particular, what are the small towns in Provence that would be suitable for performances? Ah, great question. Um, so I would suggest um, there are some really lovely venues in Arles, in Nîmes, in Avignon. Um, there, and there are really some beautiful churches in even, you know, all small towns in that area, but those are the three that we um, have connections with some venues and uh, they're beautiful, uh, beautiful churches. And sometimes, you know, having a concert in a smaller town is actually, um, you know, a very different but lovely experience because um, you really get such a local audience and they don't have many groups from the States coming to perform there. So you really get a, a very different kind of audience that's super appreciative and you know the whole town kind of turns out for the concert so 
I highly recommend always performing in small places because the audiences are just so heartfelt and, and warm. So um, great question, Diane, and I'd be happy to give you more information, of course, any any time that you're interested. But um, that's a fantastic question and great area to visit. And let's see here, we may have one more question. Uh, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any questions here. And we put some information and links in the chat so you can take a look at the festival, our um, Encore Music Appreciation Tours and our new offerings right now. So if you wanted to learn some, to have some details about those, those offerings. All right, well, once again, I would love to thank Cecilia so much for joining us today. It was so wonderful thank to hear. It was great to have you and we learned so much about beautiful Paris and definitely, I think we're all have the, the travel bug now. <laughs> so thank, thank you so much. And I hope everyone enjoyed this visit to Paris and we are all looking forward to seeing these special places in person again very soon. Um, please yeah. stay tuned for our next <laughs> Encore live event coming up on Wednesday, March 31st. It's called Five Things I Love About Italy. And uh, the details will be sent out in an email in the next week or so. So look out, be on the lookout for that. Um, and again, Cecilia, thank you so very much. We hope to, to see you on the road <laughs> out there somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Beautiful> <laughs> All right. Well, until next time, a big thank you from all of us at Encore and uh, à bientôt. <laughs>